Good morning again, everyone, and welcome to the University of the West Indies Faculty of Sport Research Seminar Series. My name is Dr. Shara Krerian, and I'll be hosting this session on behalf of Dr. Aldine Facey. I would like to commend the Faculty of Sport for their work and introduce today's presenter, PhD candidate, Ms. Alison Facey. She'll be presenting today on the topic of front leg biomechanics of Jamaican junior fast bowlers. Our panel of reviewers are Dr. Maxine Gossel-Williams, Dr. Claudette Koo thompson and Dr. Kervin Jean. I thank you and the entire audience for joining us. At this time, we will allow Ms. Facey to start her, her presentation, after which we'll allow the members of the review panel to share some feedback. And then we encourage the wider public to share any comments or questions that they may have in the chat or by using the raise hand function. Alison, you may begin. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Yan, and thank you again to the faculty for this opportunity um, that I've been invited to present, and I'm looking forward to sharing just a few of the findings so far from what seems to be a very interesting search into the wonderful world of biomechanics and cricket. So allow me a second to just bring up my screen. Great. Are you able to see my screen? Can you see what's happening? Yes. We're able to see. Okay. All right. So let's begin. So I today will be talking about front leg biomechanics of Jamaican junior fast bowlers. And there's a lot to be discussed here, but I know the time is limited. So I will try to be as succinct, but as clear as possible to bring to us what is being discovered in Jamaican cricketers, primarily fast bowlers, and how we can marry what we're learning about the biomechanics with how we can plan for cricketers, not just at the senior and elite levels, but starting with our junior cricketers, to see how can we ensure that we won't prevent injury, but ultimately optimize their performance and even longevity in the sport. So a brief presentation outline. So I'll be taking us through a few things today. Um, I'll start with an overview, and then I'll give you a brief literature summary. <laughs> I'll then discuss my rationale and the aims. Why am I doing this? What role is this going to fill in the realms of research and the sport? I'll talk about the methods and the methodology, the approach that we took to answering some of those questions. I'll discuss my results so far specific to front leg mechanics. And then there's a brief discussion that I'd like to take you through as well. So before we begin, let me just do some context setting. Um, I'm aware that everyone here may not necessarily be seeped into cricket. Um, and so I just want to set a little bit of a uh, background against what I'm talking about when I talk about biomechanics and a little bit of an introduction into cricket and the aims of cricket. So the first thing I want to define is the concept of biomechanics. So biomechanics was first described by Herbert Hatz in 1974, and he said that what it ultimately is is a study on the study, sorry, of the structure and function of biological systems by means of methods of mechanics. What he's basically saying is that through the study of mechanics and biological systems, we're able to understand how they move, how they function, how they work. And then if we have that knowledge, then not only can we manipulate it, but we can plan for it in the future. A key tenant under biomechanics is kinematics. And kinematics, simply put, is a description of motion, according to Peter McGuinness in 2012. And then a subset under kinematics specifically is joint kinematics. And that's really ultimately describing the description of the joints and by, by extension, measurements of those joints. And that's exactly what I'm hoping to present today. So continuing my overview specific to cricket now. So the aim of cricket um, is to gain as many runs as possible. So if you're the, the team that's on offense, so to speak, your aim is to gain as many runs as possible. The opposing team, the aim of that team is to minimize those possibilities for their opponent. Now the bowler largely carries that responsibility and how they do that is using the tools primarily of speed and accuracy. So we have bowlers that are pace bowlers or fast bowlers and their strategy is to minimize how many opportunities the batsman has to make a run. 
if they're using accuracy, meaning they're trying to evade as best as possible the batsman to get to the wickets before the batsman can get to the ball, right? Now, the truth is, ideally, you want to be able to marry those two. Um, but there may be a speed accuracy trade-off that we're seeing in cricket, but many fast bowlers or many bowlers, sorry, tend to go in the direction of fast bowling to use speed as their primary tool to win a cricket game. Now, in research settings, ball speed quickly became an important indicator of bowling success because it would substantially, as I mentioned, decrease the batsman's time to respond to the incoming ball. Now, the bowling action itself can be divided into four phases. The first phase is the run-up, and this is the run or the jog that's approximately 30 meters that the bowler takes to approach the pitch um, and there are significant kinematic implications because of his ball speed, his run-up speed, sorry, and ultimately his ball speed. After this stage comes the pre-delivery stride. And in the pre-delivery stride is when the bowler makes contact with the ground from previously being airborne. So he does his run-up, he does his approach, and then he gets airborne. And then once he makes contact, it takes us into the next stage which is the delivery stage or the delivery stride. So again, run up, pre-delivery stride, delivery stride, and then ultimately to their follow through. So they run up and the run up is important. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The run up into my pre-delivery stride where all the forces I've generated in the run up, I'm now going to transfer them ultimately to the hand. But first I'm going to be airborne. Then I will land on what is known as the back foot and then from the back foot, transfer those forces to the front foot. And then from the front foot, ground all the way up to my hand where the ball is for delivery. And then at the end of delivery, there is a follow through. So I'm hoping we're seeing the sequence because I'm trying to build a story for you this morning. So now let me take you briefly into the literature and a quick summary of what the literature is saying about bowling, bowling speed, and of course, front knee kinematics. So fast bowling is defined as speeds higher than 88 miles per hour, while medium fast or fast medium bowling, they use those two terms, are considered to generate speeds between 75 and 88 miles per hour. Now, there are speeds that are significantly higher than that, right? But once you've gotten to that threshold of 88, then we'll consider it according to Crick Vision 2020, 2012, they'll consider it as fast bowling. Fast bowling, as I mentioned before as well, has become the interest of many researchers, primarily because of the many biomechanical changes that the body of the bowler must endure to be successful. Now, this is interesting because many sports um, are upper limb heavy, many sports may be lower limb heavy, but what we're seeing in cricket, primarily with cricket bowling, is that it's a biomechanical haven because both the upper and the lower limb are actively involved in performing a successful bowl. In some cases, there may be um, an upper limb heavy task where the lower limb is there for support, maybe even propulsion, but really an innocent bystander to the performance. We don't see that situation in cricket. What we see happening with bowlers is that both the upper limb and the lower limb have to be actively involved in order for us to consider it a successful bowl with speed or accuracy outcomes. A next point here that was made popular by King Worthington um, in 2015, King and Worthington in 2015, is that the work of the upper limb is viewed as an extension of what the lower body generates. What they're saying is that when in that run-up stage, the reason I'm running up is so that I can generate enough velocity that I ultimately would like to transfer to the ball to pace it toward the batsman. In just one year later, Middleton, Alderson, Elliott, and Mills reiterated that by saying that the run-up generates the kinetic drive to complete the bowling action. Kinetics specific to how forces are generated. So they're saying that the run-up is what ultimately makes the ball go fast. Continuing with the review. So a straight front knee on ball release during the bowling action can guarantee not only good ball release height, but secure a closed kinetic chain delivering high velocities generated through the run-up to the cricket ball. Again, imagine if you will, a bowler is coming down 30 meters toward the pitch. 
as he's running or jogging, depending. Most pace bowlers run. They're running. He's generating velocity in his body. And what he ultimately wants to do, according to King and Worthington, is that they want to be able to maintain a straight front leg so that there is no loss of the, the velocity that they've generated from their run-up. So that from the legs on that delivery stride, they're able to utilize all that force, all that velocity, all that kinetic energy, and transfer it from the legs, ultimately to the hands, and then ultimately to the ball. And so they're saying that compromises of that posturing, meaning compromises of maintaining that straight leg, can affect bowling speed and it can affect bowling accuracy. In 2010, as well, um, Wormgore, Sean Wormgore, McKinnon, and, and Harden actually looked at the, the front leg extension at ball release. And what they found is that if there is front leg extension, generally there are higher ball speeds. And many persons actually, many researchers supported this point. So Glacier is one of them, Portis is one of them um, that supported that point that a front leg seems to be a good indicator of good ball speed. But we continue. Specific now to muscles and what the work of the muscles look like. The concentric work of the quadriceps, meaning the contracting work of the, quadri the quadriceps and the abdominals aid in the transferring of the forces from the run-up through the kinetic chain. So the whole thing I'm building so far in this literature review is that the run-up generates the forces, that the body has to maintain a particular posturing to transfer those forces to the ball, and that now we're looking at the muscles and the role that the muscles play to ensure that that transference is complete. And so they're saying the quadriceps and the abdominals play an important point or an important part in keeping that kinetic chain closed so that the ultimate velocity is transferred to the ball from the fingers. And many researchers have ratified that idea. Now, interestingly, whilst periodized general strength training can cause significant improvements in strength and low limb concentric and eccentric capacity among fast bowlers. Callahan, Samuel Callahan in 2018 found that this does not appear to translate to changes in loading experienced at the front foot contact. He's saying that though we, we did an eight week training program, we got some elite fast bowlers, some pace bowlers, we trained them for eight weeks in eccentric and concentric training. What they were finding was that even though they got stronger, even though on post tests, when we measure them, they were in fact stronger. It didn't necessarily give a linear translation to one, how fast they bowled or to their front foot contact at the point of delivery. And I want you to hold on to that point because we may be seeing it. All right. There was a study that was done um, by Benita Oliver, who is on the call. <laughs> um, and what they did is that they looked at 46 adolescent fast bowlers and they looked at greater levels of core stability and said that these resulted in higher bowling speeds, that the, the stronger and the, the greater core stability or abdominal stability that these fast bowlers had was the higher their bowling speeds. They also presented what I found as an interesting theory to say that more a more stable core resulted in greater knee bending on ball release. Now that stirs the pot a little bit because before we're thinking if we're stronger, then we should be faster. And what we need to also be faster is a straighter knee. But if they have a stronger core, what Benito and Oliver Italo is finding is that if they're stronger in the core, then they have higher ball speeds. And in another study found that they're stronger in the core and we're getting greater knee bending at the point of ball release. And so the theory was, or the speculation is, that bowlers may be making a trade-off of greater ball speeds with an extended knee and higher risk of injury for greater ball speeds with more knee flexion versus higher core stability and decreasing their risk, meaning, there are two paths to getting high ball speeds. I can keep my knees straight and risk injury, or I can bend my knee a little bit, utilize more of my core, and decrease my risk of injury. That was the finding, and we may again just be coming back to revisiting that. 
So now I take it to my rationale, which is why is this important? Why should we study something like this? Now, the first point that I want to, to make us aware of is that there are a couple of speculations on the causes of front knee collapse. That's what it's called when on the point of ball delivery, the knee bends. So when they don't have that brace to leg, when the knee bends, we call it or refer to it as front knee collapse. So there are many speculations as to the causes, but many of these speculations are born from research conducted in Europe and in North America. And Jamaica and by extension, the Caribbean are lovers of cricket, lovely cricket. Why not have a study coming out of our own um, or home that is looking at our cricketers uniquely and what's, what are we seeing biomechanically with our cricketers here? And so while strength and training related challenges can pervade international borders, meaning we can watch what's happening in North America, we can watch what's happening in Europe and make speculations and adjustments for our cricketers here, the very occurrence of front knee collapse is not even documented anywhere in the Caribbean. So all our lovers of West Indies cricket, we have no idea of what West Indian bowlers are doing. We have no idea what Jamaican bowlers are doing. And this study is hoping to fill that gap. Among West Indian cricket bowlers as well, specifically Jamaican bowlers, research is yet to effectively quantify and report these cases of collapsing front knees during bowling. But I continue. So this study can serve to open the discourse to include Jamaican fast bowlers in inferences made to upskill cricket players internationally. In cricket realms and research realms, there's a lot of conversation around how do we, how do we, um, we plan for cricket. How do we plan for cricket bowlers? How do we train them? How do we prevent injury? How do we optimize their bowling? How do we ensure that we're not um, overworking or you know, are effectively introducing load management? We need to get some Jamaicans and by extension, some Caribbean cricket bowlers into that conversation that's happening internationally. From the start line of researching incidences of front knee collapse, which is where we are today in Jamaican fast bowlers, the flame of the study will spread along its natural course to injury mitigation and ultimately prevention. And direct and indirect potential benefits to come from this study are the further implications to training protocols that may need to be adapted or devised to maintain or prevent these occurrences as per the findings of the study. That is why we're doing this. And that is why, as, as a brief excerpt from my entire rationale, those are mainly the points that we want to explore what is happening in our fast bowlers. So what are my aims? <laughs> what am I ultimately trying to achieve? So the overall aim is that we want to investigate the prevalence of front knee collapse and its possible associations with muscle strength, bowling speed to a lesser extent accuracy for this round in Jamaican junior fast bowlers. Specific objectives is that we want to determine the prevalence of front knee collapse among junior fast bowlers. And you'll see the emphasis on junior fast bowlers. It's not that there's, um, it's not that there's a lack of willingness to work with senior bowlers. We are, I'm planning to go there as well, but the thinking is if we can start early, if we can detect some of these things early, we may be able to address them early and prevent a lot of delays and heartache in the sport. Secondly, we want to examine association between front knee angles or front knee kinematics and muscle strength of the abdominals and the quadricep muscle groups in these same populations. Thirdly, we want to investigate the association between front knee angle and bowling speed among junior fast bowlers. How do we do this? What's the best way to approach this? So this study took the design of a quantitative cross-sectional analysis of relationships. So it's a descriptive, it has a descriptive component where I'm just observing, is this present or not? But also if it is present, what relationship does it share with their muscle strength? What relationship does the presence of their front knee kinematics share with their bowling speed? Secondly, I wanted to have, what was the sampling method, right? So we wanted to have a convenient sample and we did this by reaching out to the Jamaica Cricket Association and some key players who can mobilize junior cricketers from all over the island. Reached out to them, pitched the study and invited those athletes to come. We actually reached out to about 35 fast bowlers in all. And ultimately the sample size was 23 male junior bowlers across the island. So I had bowlers coming from St. Elizabeth, um, 
some coming from Westmoreland, um, a few, very few from Kingston, but all over the island that it's sufficient to say that that rural and urban was represented in this study. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the methodology of this study. So the first thing, once our bowlers came, data collection was done right here at UE at the Mona Bowl. Um, the first thing is that they had to review consent forms. As I mentioned, I'm working with junior bowlers. So they had to sign an assent form, those that were under the age of 18, and their caregivers or guardians that came with them signed a consent form for their participation as well. Then we took them through a quick medical screen, and the ultimate goal of that was to ensure that there were no injuries, there are no predisposing factors that they knew of or that we could identify that would prevent them from bowling optimally um, how they would normally in, in the context of training. We did this outside um, on standard size pitch, uh, which gave them the room to determine their length of run-up. And they used relatively new to not so new cricket balls, but all participants used the same cricket balls. Then we took them to do some anthropometric testing. What we're looking at, we're looking at weight and height. Ultimately, as well, we're looking at muscle strength. And so we use this device here, the handheld dynamometer. And the purpose was to objectively measure what is their muscle strength in select muscle groups. So I did mention the abdominals, I did mention the quadriceps, but we also did the hamstrings, we did internal external rotators of the hip, we did um, we did uh, upper limb as well um, in that first boat of data collection. And so we used the handheld dynamometer to quantify that. And then for the abdominals, we took them through the seven stage plank test. Now it's seven stages, you have 30 seconds to do a different pose, each time and it's a continuous test and we determine your stage by the last stage that you were able to complete in good posturing and sustain the hold for the 30 seconds. After that, then they did their self-directed warm-up. They would warm up for a roughly 10 minutes um, and so they would have some practice bowls involved in that, some stretches, some activities, but it was ultimately self-directed. So I wasn't introducing any new factors into what would have been their routine for warming up, but it was supervised warming up, but self-directed. After that, then we'd bring them over and we would put on the markers. Now we assigned three reflective markers. We use the Simimotion capture system, which I'll show you a video of real quickly, as to how the cameras were set up. We used three cameras and the markers were placed at the hip, the knee, and at the ankle. So each participant was done with three reflective markers to be detected by our camera system. Once those were on and once they were secure, which presented some challenges to be very honest with you, but once they were secure, then we had our fast bowlers go ahead and they bowled eight, roughly eight to 10 attempts. We're trying to capture about 10 for everybody, but reasonably we captured fairly about eight bowls per participant. So that's 23 bowlers with eight bowls per bowler. Once that was done, then we would remove the markers and we had a quick debrief to find out, well, did your bowl feel how you would bowl normally? And two, did you sustain any injuries? Did you feel like there was anything that prevented you from bowling optimally or comparably with how you would bowl in the context of a game or a competition? So I want to pause here because I want to just briefly show you what the setup, a bit of what the setup looks like. You really only see the cameras in this, but I want you to be able to appreciate what that looked like. So there are three cameras. There are two on this side that are closer to you, and there's one on the third, or the third one, sorry, is on the opposite side. And so we're right mostly at the crease, right where they would come to be able to capture at the point of ball release, what was the knee doing? Uh, Lego. Right. All right, so continuing with the methodology. So the knee angles, using the video and the motion capture system, the knee angles were calculated after the day. So after date collection, we went back, looked at the, the videos and used the motion capture system to determine what those knee angles were per participant, per attempt. So we didn't just choose their best, we used every attempt that we could salvage and we captured knee angles for every participant. 
Then a data analysis was done using SPSS version 20 for Pearson's bivariate correlation, because I'm trying to look at knee angles against speed. I'm looking at knee angles against strength um, for the quadriceps and the abdominals. No. I'd like to show you two videos here. I have two videos here from that boat of data collection and they go pretty quickly, but I'll play them first and then I'll slow them down and ask you if you'd be able to determine based on what we've spoken about so far, if you can detect that knee bend or not. So that goes by pretty quickly, no worries, I'll slow it down. And then there's this one that also goes by pretty quickly. But let's slow it down, and I want you to be able to appreciate what I was describing. Oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. So we missed the run-up because the run-up would be captured elsewhere, right? We're coming now into the pre-delivery stride because he has made back foot contact, back foot contact coming from being airborne, and no. No is our delivery stride. So he's coming in. Unfortunately, you're not able to see at the point of ball release, which is probably just about here. And so at this point, oh dear. At this point, this is what I'm trying to capture. What is the knee doing at this point here, right? And so you're able to probably at this point see the three markers that I was discussing, one at the hip, one at the knee, and one at the ankle. And that's what we use to plug into the semi-motion capture to determine exactly what the knee angles were. So knee flexion or no knee flexion? Is there a knee bend or is there not any knee bend? While you think about that, let me show you this one quickly. Now you may look at this with a naked eye and think, well, this guy, his knee is significantly straighter. However, that's why we need the semi motion capture because at the point of delivery, was it as straight as it seems it was? And this, if this was his point of ball release, then we are not as straight as we thought. But nevertheless, we don't add our own thinking to the findings. We report exactly what we find and that's exactly what I want to go into next. I'll show you the results. So here are the results. What did we find? We found, remember, I'm trying to capture, is front knee collapse even a problem in junior fast bowlers? Are we seeing that any at all? The answer is 100% of the population that we brought in of our junior fast bowlers were in fact collapsing their front knee at the point of ball delivery. Second question that I wanted to answer was, well, if they are collapsing, what are the degree angles? What are the angles that we're seeing? The average knee angles across bowlers that were collapsing was about 43 degrees. So they're collapsing to about 43 degrees on average. Um, some were less and some were more, but on average, we're seeing about 43 degrees of collapsing or knee flexion at the point of ball release. And then I did the seven stage plank um, abdominal assessment with these cricketers, junior cricketers albeit, but seven stage plank assessment. And what did we find? That the average plank staging out of seven was about 2.6. So there were some people who received five. I think there was one that went to six, but we had a lot of ones. We had a lot of twos. And so the average that we ultimately came away with was 2.6 with the plank staging. Now, before you come down too heavy on these guys or too hard, remember these are junior bowlers, 16, 15, 14, 17. So, you know, let's keep it in perspective. But here are more of the results. So I wanted to look at knee angle versus speed. What did we find? That the greater the knee bend, the higher the bowling speeds. Now, descriptively, the greater the knee bend, those that had more knee flexion, actually had higher bowling speeds, which which was in, an interesting finding. Let me leave it there for now. It was an interesting finding. 
And the average bowling speed that we saw was about 67.6 miles per hour. And I, that's the average, but many of them actually were in that fast medium range. We had up to 79.9, 79.7, 78.6. Um, and we had some, some pretty low ones. Um, and on the post or on the briefing at the end of it, they would say, boy, you know, I didn't have my shoes or I didn't feel like I bowled properly or, you know, there was something that held them back. But on average, that was the range that we're seeing. And this speed was actually captured using the Stalker 2 radar gun. Then we looked at knee angle versus quadriceps strength. What were we seeing there? So when we ran this in SPSS, we didn't find any statistical significance unfortunately, between the quadriceps strength and the knee angle. So it was concentric strength that we captured. Remember the contracting strength of the quadriceps using the dynamometer. But when we ran that in SPSS, we weren't seeing any relationship for me to report as statistically significant between quadriceps strength and knee angle. And then looking at knee angle and core strength, what was that like? Again, no statistical significance. However, the relationship was interesting. We found that the higher the core strength was the greater the knee angle. And that sounds familiar if you're paying attention earlier. That the higher the core strength, the greater the knee angle. So how do we make sense of that? So here we come to the discussion. These are the findings. So what support is there in the literature for anything like this? Remember I spoke to you about a study done by Oliver et al. in 2015 and again in 2022. And these two papers give perspective to the finding of the knee angle versus speed, the, the finding of the knee angle versus speed of greater knee flexion causing higher ball speeds. Remember previously we were saying that for higher ball speeds, you really need an extended knee. But we were seeing, similar to what the findings were in South Africa, is that with greater knee bending, some of our athletes were in fact getting higher ball speeds. Remember context though, it was a statistically significant. So I'm just reporting descriptively in this case. Another is that bowlers may be using other mechanisms to increase ball release speed than just a braced front knee. And I mentioned that earlier right, coming out of the study, that they, they may be employing other, other avenues. Now, the truth is, in 2012 or 2011, I believe, um, Hanley came up with a theory that there are about 74 indicators of ball speed, 74. And from that 74, he identified about five of them that could have been um, indicators of ball speed. But if there's 74, then it gives perspective as to why a single one may not necessarily be giving you statistical significance every time for bowling speed. Then the possibility exists that these junior bowlers could be accepting the trade-off of more abdominal recruitment, thus more knee flexion on ball release, resulting in comparable high speeds. So instead of trying to get high speeds or high ball speeds by keeping the front knee straight, that what they're in fact probably trying to do is to get the same outcome that preserves them from injury by recruiting more of the abdominals. Could it be? This finding, however, does not explain why there was no significance seen between the quadriceps strength and the knee angle. But for that, better support may come from a study done in 2021, where an eight-week strength program done by Samuel Callahan, as I mentioned, um, was developed and administered for low body strength, power, and eccentric muscle capacity. And when on post-assessment, what they found is that even though muscle strength had increased, as I mentioned earlier, it had no significant weighting on their front leg um, contact kinetics no significant weighting on what the front leg was doing at the point of ball release. And so the researchers concluded that strengthening in isolation of skill training offered no effect in bowling speed performance. Now, this is important information that we can use. And this is a recent study. This is just two years ago, right? This is important information that we can use and that we can make sense of here in the Caribbean. 
could it be that we are not marrying skill training with our fitness training? Could it be that our athletes are finding other avenues because they're trying to shy away from what they've seen or what they've heard can cause injury? And so they're using other mechanisms. But that's the purpose of research so that we can ask the questions and answer it with the, re the relevant methodologies and come out with the reports to say, well, this is what we are seeing. How do we address that? And if there's a problem, how do we fix it? And if there's information that's useful, how do we use it? And so that's essentially what I was seeing coming out of junior fast bowlers and their front knee mechanics at a point of ball release in bowling. Now, before I wrap, I just wanted to share a few of the limitations and tell you how we've been addressing those on the second boat of data collection. So limitations, one of the first ones is that we had no measure for eccentric hamstring strength. So I mentioned that we use the handheld dynamometer and the handheld dynamometer, a useful tool, but what I'm getting from it is primarily concentric. So the difference between concentric and eccentric is that concentric muscle strength is the contracting muscle strength. The muscle strength we get when the two ends of a muscle come closer together. Eccentric muscle strength is when the muscle is doing work but it's doing work by tension on the muscle, meaning the two ends are pulling further apart, right? We had no measure in the first bout of data collection, which is what I'm reporting on now, to actually measure the eccentric work of the hamstrings. And the, the for me to be able to utilize something like the quadriceps hamstring ratio, it would have required the hamstrings, and that would have been a useful indicator possibly into what am I seeing at the front knee? So we didn't have anything like that. What we've done for the second boat of data collection is added the Nordic drop in the presence of the semi motion capture system to identify at what particular and specific point are these athletes actually breaking, which gives an indication of what the hamstrings eccentrically are able to manage. So I look forward to using that data and reporting on it maybe in the future, in the near future. Second limitation is that there was no assessment of core recruitment or indications of force output. If these are the findings or if this is what people had seen, so I mentioned the Oliver study, if this is what is happening, then it would be useful to use some kind of kinetic measurement as to what is really happening at the core or what is really happening at the lower back. Can we somehow identify what motions and what forces are being generated at the different joints as they go through this entire kinetic chain of bowling? It would have been useful to have that in the first boat, but we made sure to have it in the second boat. And so we used IMUs or inertial measurement units to capture that force data and kin kinetic data. So hopefully again, I can report on that sometime soon. And then thirdly, um, a limitation that proved quite annoying, I'll be very honest with you, was the retaining of the reflective markers throughout the bowling attempts. Now, this made it into the presentation because the challenge this presented is that if the markers fell off, it meant that we either had to discard that study, that, that attempt, sorry, by that participant, or we had to make some kind of alternate arrangements to capture their joint angles, which is less than ideal for a study that can give us um, accurate depictions or accurate measurements, sorry, of their knee angles. So not being able to keep the markers on was a problem. How have we addressed that for the second boat? Um, we're using the CIMIT to the markerless tracking. And so what that allows us to do is that even if my markers evade me, even if they fall off, that I should be able to, without the markers, tell the cameras and tell the system, this is the bony landmark that I'd like you to measure the angles from. Now, ideally you want the markers on. And so we went through many tests um, and many trial periods to figure out how do we keep these markers on. But ultimately we were able to get a better outcome on the second boat of data collection because we identified these as limitations and made measures to address them. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. These are the list of my references and there are more, but just a representative sample of, of all that I had to, to research and to look at to present this to you today. So thank you again. I look forward to your questions.
Congratulations, Ms. Spacey, and thank you for such an insightful presentation for us this morning. I would like to invite our reviewers on the panel who are here. I think I saw Dr. Maxine Gossel-Williams and Dr. Claudette Coot thompson You may share your feedback with us. Okay, morning, I'll go first, because I'm probably the greenest in this area. You are welcome. <laughs> But um, thanks, um, Ms. Spacey. It was, it was actually very clear for somebody who, yes, I enjoy cricket and I can't tell you that I will sit and watch it for, for days, but <laughs> I did understand your presentation very well. Literature review was very clear um, and uh, you know it really did lead me very well into the introduction. As a little thrown by the fact that the figures that you had given in the literature review were in miles per hour, and I can't believe it's just miles per hour data we have seen that, that most of our Caribbean countries, I think, are using metric. So um, <laughs> you didn't have anything at all from any country, any other country other than, I'm assuming that was U.S. data. Right. So some of the data that I shared is U.S. data, um, data coming from England as well and South Africa. But truthfully, there there are some studies that document it in kilometers per hour. But I, I stayed with miles per hour because the radar gun that I used uh, mm -hmm. that I got, of course, not from the Caribbean, documented in miles per hour. So I wanted to just keep that um, the what's the term I'm looking for, to keep it in line so that it made sense against what I was presenting. Or you could convert it. Or I could convert it, that is true. So I actually was thinking of it and I was saying, 88 times two, that's the speed we get at. That's like more than tennis players um, in terms of the speed. Yeah. So my question now, I, I totally understand the concept and the, the knee and the abdominal and you know the, the whole thing of the speed but i was just wondering and i think i did hear you mention it a little bit in discussion the back strength doesn't play a role in all of this and, and if so why have you not focused on including that absolutely yes thanks for that question so i wouldn't be able to talk about everything um because we would be here for weeks so as I mentioned, one study identified that there are 74 parameters that indicate ball speed. Um, and along that as well is the hip separation, hip shoulder separation angle, pelvis rotation, lower back strength, back foot contact, um, lower limb strength, um, pelvis rotation. Um, there, there are many factors actually that contribute to, to that. And particularly if the direction that I wanted to focus on was largely into the injury prevention, then I would do, I would talk a lot more about the low limb strength and back strength, because that's a lot of, a lot of the studies that I saw that mentioned the back were in the direction of, well, let's look at back strength so that we can report on the kind of injuries that we're seeing. And in fact, lower back injuries really are the, the maybe the primary injuries that we see with cricket fast so yes it is it is significantly uh, a contributor to ball speed um, but not so much right now we're seeing in the literature for front knee collapse so we're not seeing any research definitively speaking to back strength lower back strength and front knee collapse but in my second bout of data collection I did include IMUs to be able to generate force data that could give an indication of just how hard these muscles are working. And hopefully I can have that to report for you the second time around. Okay. So I understand effectively what you're saying is that there's not, and there's not necessarily enough evidence for the strength of the back to support the, what is, what is happening with the knee or the relationship right. is not that great right now. What about height? The bowler's height. The bowler's height. The bowler's height, yes, plays into how fast they can bowl. Um, primarily looking at it from the biomechanical standpoint of how high can they release that ball because the higher I can release that ball with the potential energy of changing my H factor, which is the height factor, can give me more output of energy and maybe greater ball velocities. So the height does play a part for sure. Um, I did not include that here. I will include it in the second, the second against ball speed and run it maybe against the front knee collapse and see the relationship that we're assessing there. 
Um, but I haven't seen again much persons zoning into these single parameters across across these first world countries anymore. So a lot of the studies that I see mm -hmm. that single parameters were early and maybe earlier than 10 years ago, what they're actually trying to do now is look at subject-based or individual-based um, biomechanics. So if I take one single bowler, I'm looking at your height, I'm looking at your strength, I'm looking at your um, force data, I'm looking at your kinematics and trying to make sense of as an individual, how does mm -hmm. that impact speed? So they're looking at individual-based and group-based assessments for predictors of speed, predictors of injury, predictors of kinematics right now. Um, right. So again, it's lumped probably into the 74 parameters, but mm -hmm. kind of on its own, um, biomechanically, theoretically makes sense. But right now I'm not seeing much evidences for that either on its yeah. own. Right, but in, just remember in your justification, you did point out that the reality is that you're not getting a lot of data from this population and you may find something novel. If you at least have, the fact is that if you're measuring them, you can at least do some correlation just to see. Absolutely, absolutely. So, That's exactly it, the plan. Yeah. Um, well, years to come that I can run correlations with all the data I've collected. Okay. I was curious about the, if you could just go back to the slide where you had the those charts with the, the values, the three values that you calculated. Sure. And I was just wondering why at this point, I'm only seeing the means. Why not also give us the the variation, whether it's in confidence interval, standard deviation, so we can see the spread? Uh, why would you not want to enrich your data like that? Well, I could, but I was I was trying to um I was trying to advertise this presentation mostly as a descriptive study. So even though I did run some SPSS um tests looking at the Pearson's bivariate. Um, I, no, I it's, not, it's not the test I want to see, it's a variation. I mean, if you remember the other day, our posters were pointing out that the, the, in terms of our PMP versus GLP, who is leading and these data just presented as a mean and not presenting standard deviation, giving us a false sense of who oh. is actually the favored party. So okay. at this point, you have a population of 23 athletes. Right. So what I'm suggesting is that don't just give us the mean, enrich the data by giving us the standard deviation. Um, can, this can, it, it may be better presented with the, the 95 confidence intervals. I mean, once you have that, it, it just looks like you're doing a, a better study than just giving us a point value. Understood, noted. Thank you so much for that. Right, so now I just have some questions with the sampling now. The, um, how did you determine 23 as your, your number here for this study? Right. So we just invited all, all junior bowlers. So we have, um, there are a few cricket clubs across Jamaica. And what we wanted to do ideally was to get all the fast bowlers. So if a cricket club has about 15 athletes, what, what the research was telling me when I asked our own across JCA, is that each club may have three to four fast bowlers. So I think the number of clubs, if memory serves me correctly, was, this number is slipping me. Um, I don't think it was more than 15 clubs that we had across the island. And mm -hmm. so the map in my head was 15 clubs with three, roughly three fast bowlers. It seemed reasonable to try to get all those fast bowlers. So as I mentioned, we reached out through JCA and we, we tried to get through to all of them. Um, okay. My contact okay. told me that he reached out to 35, but we only got 23. All right. So it was the full complement you wanted to get, which is 35. All right. All right. And they they are playing with clubs, so they're actually being professionally trained. So, so these guys are, well, you know, it would depend on how we define professionally trained. But yes, they're playing for their high schools and they're playing with junior junior clubs at this point. Okay. The reason why I ask is because it, I, I suspect in, in my mind that cricket is stronger in the rural areas. So those boys are probably playing much better than the ones in the the, the urban areas. Right Although my, my boys' school, Wilmot's, is the top school playing <laughs> now. So, I, I and I'm assuming it's because of, um what's his name? Hines, I think his two sons are there. So, yes. 
So, but I'm just figuring the strength is stronger in the role. And I just wondered if your data might be impacted if you had more rural persons or more urban students and as something you may want to look at as a possible variation. But you did you did indicate that there are wit clubs, so I'm assuming that there's some measure of professionalism across the clubs, if, if that is if, if that is the case. It's that's, it's likely, but that's that's important to look at as well. That urban versus rural breakdown for sure. So I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, it, I will confess it's not the first time I'm being exposed to this um, Dr. Rupshan Martin. So I, we're all impressed with the with her work so far and looking forward to, to greater things. And I, I do recognize the enthusiasm because it's only somebody who's enthusiastic could actually put in their justification um, the flame of the study there's nothing scientific about that but i'm assuming that you want to bring in some artists some poetic um content <laughs> all right thank you, so all much. Much. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you very much dr yes. maxine gossel williams um i'd like to open the floor to anyone else who has any comments or questions for miss facey Dr. Martin, would you like to say anything to Alison regarding her presentation or um, Dr. Harvey or Dr. Benito? Um, I must say, I'm I seeing... Can wait for you. <laughs> no, no, things are getting really dark here. Um, I must say, um, seeing um, Alison grow from the time, I mean, we met each other just before COVID and then COVID happened. And I mean, looking at this presentation, my heart is pounding of just pride. And I think um, your institution is really developing um, these this PhD students and you're going to produce a brilliant quality. So congratulations to all of you and specifically congratulations to Alison. Brilliantly well done. And the way that this whole session has been run is superb. I'm, I'm proud to be involved. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Oliver. Um, Harvey, are you able to comment? Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm here. <laughs> um, yeah, so firstly, just to kind of echo everything that Benita's just said there, um, it's a re really good presentation. Um, really interesting as well that uh, you're also, your findings are echoing those of Benita's previous studies as well, um, which are really important. Um, not least because in the in the practical world out there, the kind of the, the message that's that's going out on kind of every possible social media uh, site and the expectations that are going to coaching manuals and the rest is about this, you know, this desperate need to have a brace front leg. So the the, the 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 sheer fact that we're demonstrating yet again that actually that's not the case, I think it's really, really important. So yeah, really well done. Thank you so much, Harvey. Appreciate it. <laughs> So echoing everybody's uh, sentiments, um, Alison, excellent work. Um, and I think I'm even more excited actually to see what we get out of the next phase. So as Alison said, she's been presenting preliminary data here, but we also have you know quite a bit of data that was collected a couple of weeks ago that she now has to wade through correcting some of the, or addressing some of the issues as she's pointed out. Um, so seeing all of the information put together here really does create a lot of excitement for us for what do we get out of the next phase of it. Um, and uh, Alison, I'm not sure how many of our cricket fraternity was in here, meaning the, the athletes, I suspect not many because they would have been in classes at this time. So mm -hmm. I think we need to make a special effort to ensure that um, JCA organizes a presentation to share the preliminary, because even though it's preliminary and there are issues that we sought to correct with the other phase, I think it's important to begin to share the data with them now and begin to have the conversation you know, with the coaches, with the, the athletes themselves. They were all very keen to know what we've gotten out of it 
Um, I know some of them have gotten their video recordings that they and their coach can sit and analyze. Right. But the full picture of what we've seen, you know, when you put it all together, it's important that we begin to share that that information with them as well. So excellent presentation, and I'm looking forward to the next set of analysis and what we're getting out of it as we, we move forward to create a more comprehensive picture um, for, for you know what's happening here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin. So I'm looking in the chat and we have a question for you, Alison. It's asking, what is Planck staging? Oh, yes, great. Um, so the standard Planck that everybody does for exercise right where you're on your forearms and you're on your toes and it's an abdominal or a core strengthening activity right the plank staging it's a test that we use that has seven phases so it starts in the traditional plank stance for 30 seconds if you can hold it you've completed stage one the second stage is with your right arm raised the left uh, the left Forearm is still on the floor. The feet are still on the floor. If you can hold that for 30 seconds, you're in stage two. And so we go up to three, four, five, six, and ultimately seven, where we're switching hands. So the third stage is the hand. The fourth stage is the right leg raised. The fifth stage is the, the left leg raised. The sixth stage is the left and the right. So um, I think it's right hand and left leg. And then the seventh stage is left hand and right leg. So if they can sustain those for 30 second holds, then that's that's the system that we use to get an idea of the core strength um, in our study. So that's the plank staging system, the seven stage plank assessment. Perfect, the person understands clearly. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to ask any questions? I see um, Michelle sent you congratulatory messages. She says, you know, very well done. And Dr. Anderson was saying that most of the research is done in the UK and in Australia, therefore the miles per hour is most used. Um, I also want to highlight at this, at this point that we had quite a good turnout and support, especially from some of our graduates, um, well-wishers and supporters of you, I'm sure, Alison, and also from current students at the Cave Hill, Mona and St. Augustine campus. Thank you very much for joining us. So if there are no more comments or questions, I am going to close the session at this point, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.